Educational Communications and this station present Environmental Directions with Nancy Perlman. On this series, we explore the effects of human influence on the Earth's ecosystems and discuss solutions to environmental problems which affect the quality of life on this planet. Environmental Directions gives you the kind of information you need to help you participate in decisions impacting your community, the nation, and the world. Now, here's your host, Nancy Perlman. Hello. For the next half hour, we're going to be talking about abalone and how important they are to the California marine ecosystem. With my guest, Anne Velisis. She is an award-winning independent scholar. Her books explore the human relationship with nature, food, and the environment through history, providing deeper perspective and insight into pressing modern-day issues. She is author of Kitchen Literacy, How We Lost Knowledge of Where Food Comes From and Why We Need to Get It Back, and also Discovering the Unknown Landscape, A History of America's Wetlands. Her most recent book is Abalone, The Remarkable History and Uncertain Future of California California's iconic shellfish. Welcome back to Environmental Directions. Thank you so much, Nancy. Every time I read your books, I am marveling at the research that you do and the important information that you are providing to people. Compelling stories of loss and recovery of the very plants and animals important to our cultural and culinary history. And abalone is one of those species that a lot of Americans aren't that familiar with, as you explain in your book, because they weren't allowed to send abalone to other parts of the country. But in California, it has been a major animal. Tell us what abalone really are. Yes, abalone are a shellfish, a big, beautiful shellfish. I think of them as being iconic in California, kind of like salmon in the Pacific Northwest or lobsters in Maine. They are a beautiful shellfish. Sometimes they're called a snail because they have a spiraling shell, but they're really kind of more like a flat animal animal, a flat shell that fits up against a rock. And what makes them particularly unique is two things. As I mentioned, the shell is absolutely beautiful. Its interior is iridescent, which means it just shimmers like silver or chrome. It's just remarkable to see. And the other thing is that the animal itself uh, has a very big foot that attaches to a rock, and so it holds the shell down around it. And that big foot is, of course, what people like to eat. So it became a very beloved meat. The animal abalone is important in marine ecosystems because it's kind of a grazer and a scavenger. It eats kelp. It converts kelp into meat and energy in the ecosystem. But it's also incredibly important culturally, or it has been, because of its beautiful shell and the meat that everybody really used to cherish. What is the lifespan of abalone? And is it different for each species or about the same? I think it is probably different for each species, but abalone, the white abalone, which is the most imperiled, they suspect the lifespan is about 30 years. The reason it's important to know that, it's because these animals, they have a long life and they reproduce only a few times in their whole lives successfully. One of the strategies for animals that live in ecosystems like the ocean, where they just send out their gametes into the ocean, and they're not always going to be successful, is that they have to live a long enough time to make sure they can reproduce themselves. So that's the strategy of the abalone. In the beginning of your book, you discuss the significance of abalone among the indigenous cultures. And of course, there's so many tribes of Native Americans up and down the California coast. Did they all love the abalone? Yeah. One of the fascinating parts of the story, Nancy, was really trying to delve into that part of abalone history. For 13,000 years, abalone were part of culture on the coast, and they were eaten for the first 6,000 years. They were a key part of subsistence along with other shellfish. And then there were more cultural cultural uses that evolved for the shell, beautiful ornaments and dazzling regalia that became used in ceremonial purposes and that are still used by indigenous people on California's coast today. And abalone were traded all around the state of California and beyond into the desert southwest, over the Rocky Mountains. And so it's that brilliant iridescent aspect of the shell that just made it so captivating to everyone. You described how 
abalone had to stay in California, so most of the rest of the United States did not experience abalone on their dinner table. How do you get people to be concerned about an animal that they've never seen, they've never eaten, they don't experience in their particular area? Yeah, I thought it was fascinating to realize that the reason that abalone is a big deal in California, but very few people know about abalone outside of California, owes to this historic hangover. The state of California decided to stop abalone exports in 1913 as a matter of conservation and also to exclude the Asian fishermen at that time. And it's been a challenge to get people to know what abalone are. One of the things I've found is people are fascinated to learn about poaching or conflicts with these animals because they haven't been accessible around the country. I think people have fewer firsthand experiences. Abalone really is a California icon and a really a California phenomenon. And so it's a challenge to get people elsewhere to care about them. I remember sadly collecting them when I was a child in the 50s. And we loved the beautiful shells. They look gorgeous. I don't know why the animal developed that iridescent coloring. There are seven species and they're sort of named by the color. They're red, black, white. What are they? That was a question I had because the iridescence is on the interior of the shell. It was just so captivating to me, and I had to understand well, why on earth does this animal make this beautiful, brilliant, iridescent shell that basically no one sees until the animal is dead. You know, many animals like birds that have brilliant feathers use that brilliance to attract mates and such. But it turns out with abalone, they think that the reason the shell is so brilliant has nothing to do with anything visual. It has to do with the structure of of the shell and being strong. Obviously, the animal needs to have a super strong shell, and it's made up of tiny little tiles of calcium carbonate that are layered. And it's the structure of those layers that makes the shell super strong, but it also creates the phenomenon of iridescence because it turns out that the thickness of those tiny tiles of calcium carbonate is similar to the wavelength of light. So when light hits the surface of those uh, little tiny calcium carbonate tiles and is diffracted, it just makes this brilliant iridescence. You kind of can't help but just be captivated by it. It's amazing. By the time I was a teenager, the abalone that were in the tide pools had been picked over by recreationalists and sports divers and commercial divers. In the early 70s, I went to one of the Channel Islands, San Nicolas, and was marveling at the fact that I saw three abalone on top of each other. It was a protected island because it belonged to the Navy and it hadn't been picked over. It just shows how abalone was like that, I'm sure, along the entire California coastline. Yeah, there were times when abalone were super abundant along the coast. But one of the things that's very interesting in this story, Nancy, that I tell is that there are many people like you who remember this period of incredible abalone abundance and feel a tremendous sense of loss at that because of the reasons abalone were cherished. For a certain period of California history, they were kind of a fixture on the coast. People ate them and enjoyed collecting them and all that. But that super abundance actually owed to an earlier period of environmental disruption. To understand abalone on the coast, you kind of have to go back to a much earlier time, which is the time of the fur trade, when Europeans first showed up on the West Coast and started to hunt sea otter pelts. And what happened at that time is they were just going gangbusters and literally decimated sea otters in the North Pacific all the way down the California coast. Sea otters, it turns out, are a key predator for abalone. And when the predators were removed, it unwittingly unleashed abalone to grow in super abundance. And then when subsequent colonists showed up, they thought that this super abalone abundance was just the natural way of the coast. 
but really it was already a system that was out of whack. And I found that this fundamental misunderstanding or the fact that people kind of forgot that earlier history set us up to misunderstand the biology of abalone because everybody thought that these creatures would just be inexhaustible, that they could hold up to such heavy fishing pressure. And it turned out that they're not. They're actually animals that don't always reproduce on a regular basis and such. So that is a key part of the story that I told was to go back and um, dig deeper. In fact, in your book, you describe how little information really existed from research by biologists and how little was really known about these species. And that hampered any kind of reintroduction, captive breeding programs, maintaining the ecosystem because people knew so little about the abalone. Yeah, one of the things that I found fascinating that part of the story of my book is basically the history of marine science. And because abalone actually live deep underwater, except for you mentioned the one species that grows and lives in the intertidal zone is a black abalone, but the other species are all subtidal and live deep underwater. It's very difficult to learn about and understand those deep water environments until after we get technologies like scuba diving equipment. And even then, as people start going into deeper water environments, studying what happens underwater is just painstakingly slow. I just had this sense of people learning what the animals eat, learning about their behavior, their reproduction. You had to learn one little bit at a time, and it would take many years to learn those things. It was quite an eye-opener just to realize how science gets built in that way. I think oftentimes people think that science is just a body of knowledge, but when you go back and look at how people learn things through time, it's really quite eye-opening. When I grew up, we thought that the food in the ocean would always be there and that it was unlimited almost, and yet we have discovered that it's not that way at all. Yet commercial divers and recreational divers for over 100 years have been exploiting these species without knowing how much they can reproduce and maintain their numbers. Yeah, and that went back to that early misunderstanding because abalone actually spawn in a way that's called broadcast spawning. So they reproduce by sending their gametes out into the ocean and intermingling in the ocean waters. And so it turns out if there are not enough of them close enough together, their gametes can get just diluted and it makes it harder for abalone to reproduce. So you can imagine when there were a ton of them, when they were super abundant, they were far more able to reproduce at a high level. But as the animals started getting picked out, as they were fished and then overfished ultimately, there were fewer left to reproduce. And so that created part of the problem that we ended up having with abalone. Now, all of our abalone species are imperiled and two are on the endangered species list. So, you know, one of the key questions I was interested in asking in my book is, how is it that the animals that we care about so much that we cherish, especially those animals that we use for food, because we like them not only because they're cute, we like them because we like to eat them. How is it that we can let these animals just become so imperiled? And um, that was one of the key questions I was interested to investigate. And you certainly did a fantastic investigation that opened up what happens in society and politically regarding these species to the point where you even discuss racism because of Chinese and Japanese divers sending the abalone back to Asia. Yeah, it was very, a very interesting chapter in our history when in the 19th century, during the gold rush, Chinese immigrants first came to America looking to work in the gold fields, but they found on the California shores this fabulous super abundance of abalone. And it turns out that abalone were cherished and beloved all around the Pacific and had already been really overfished over on the Asia side of the Pacific. But Chinese had long esteemed abalone for their meat and the beautiful shells. So quickly, the Chinese immigrants set up an export industry to collect fish for abalone on the California shore, dry it out and export it back. And that actually became one of the first big trans-Pacific industries. And that went on for decades without 
any regulation at all without any of the common things that we now think about for regulating the harvest of fish and wildlife. But in the absence of that, I mean, it was sort of interesting. Two things came together at once. That was about the time when people were becoming concerned about conservation because of market hunting elsewhere. Buffalo were hunted down. Back east, the shad and salmon runs were decimated. Of course, the story of the passenger pigeon, all those things were happening. People were worried about overhunting of fish and wildlife. And that corresponded also with the same time of just a tremendous racism against Asian American immigrants. In the absence of any effective regulation of harvest, really what happened is there were very racially motivated focused efforts to get rid of the Chinese fishermen and the Japanese fishermen. So it was interesting to see the overlap of those things and to be reminded of just such hideous, noxious history that we have of racism in California. I urge everybody to read more about this important species and how humans relate to it in the book, Abalone, The Remarkable History and Uncertain Future of California's Iconic Shellfish, written by my guest, Anne Vilisis. One of the things, Nancy, that was kind of interesting to pick up on that, that abalone were being exported, is that when European or white American colonists showed up in California, they didn't know how to eat abalone, and so they did not regard them as food. And that's because that big fat foot that we described at the beginning, to eat it as a meat, it needs to be specially prepared. It has to be pounded and tenderized in order to make it edible. And they didn't know about that. And if you didn't do that, it kind of sounds like it tasted like, you know, rubber. It was just pretty much inedible. And so the Chinese and then the Japanese who were fishing after the Chinese were excluded, they had a long cultural tradition. They knew how to prepare abalone, to dry and prepare abalone to use in their cuisine. But Americans did not. And it wasn't until the export industry was shut down in 1913, largely for reasons of racism and xenophobia, that a domestic interest in abalone grew. And one of the fun little stories they tell in my book is there was a chef, a German chef actually, that decided to experiment with abalone meat. And he sliced it and pounded it, kind of like you'd make Wiener schnitzel into abalone fillets. And he really promoted it in California. And so it really wasn't until the early 20th century that abalone became such a big deal for California eaters, these abalone steaks and fillets. You have so many fun stories, so much important information in your book, and we're going to talk more about it when we return in a moment with Anne Velisis. Environmental Directions with Nancy Perlman continues with further discussion of the world's critical ecological issues. For more information, you may call 310-559-9160 or go to www.ecoprojects.org. Now, here's Nancy. I'm speaking with Anne Velisis. She is an award-winning independent scholar, researcher, specializing in our foods. She's authored the book, Abalone, The Remarkable History and Uncertain Future of California's Iconic Shellfish. We've been talking about abalone, how abundant it was, how it maintained itself in an ecosystem until another species was overhunted. When abalone were overhunted, you described how sea urchins took off. What is the total relationship with abalone and the other life like kelp and fish in the areas where you would find abalone, which obviously is the rocky tide pools, the rocky shores below the water? Yeah, that's a great question, Nancy. And it's one that's becoming all the more important right now as we realize how important kelp forest ecosystems are, especially to our larger climate question, because it turns out kelp forests sequester carbon. The way it works is that abalone love to eat little bits and pieces of kelp pieces of kelp that drift, that are broken apart from the kelp and drift. So they're kind of like scavengers that convert these little pieces of kelp into energy, you know, so the sun's energy through the kelp into the meat of the abalone shell. The abalone are in turn eaten by large fish like sheephead and cabazon, depending on where you are on the California coast. They also serve a function to hold space on the reef. So they are grazers. They eat microalgae on the reef too. When they kind of move on the reef, they hold open space for their 
progeny and for some other reef dwelling creatures to live and to reproduce into cold space. When abalone are diminished in the ecosystem, it kind of creates space for other creatures like urchins to take over. And it's not really so much that that is a cause and effect, but these things can happen at the same time. So we have on the coast right now, I and mean, it's happened at other times in the past, but especially happened in Northern California over the past six or seven years, and it's swept down into Central California and the Channel Islands as well, cases where sea urchins have expanded and have grown into barrens situations. So they've over multiplied to becoming dominant in the ecosystem. And they're voracious eaters of kelp. So what happens is when the urchins take over, there's not enough kelp for abalone or for other creatures. And it ends up kind of creating almost like a desert-like ecosystem. So that's been happening in a number of places, unfortunately. It's important to understand that to get abalone back, to restore abalone, we need for kelp to come back because that's what abalone like to eat. And yet, as long as we have the situation where urchins are dominant, it's very hard for abalone to come back. And in Northern California, as I said, we've had this situation where many thousands of abalone have been killed because they haven't had enough to eat. We talked earlier about overfishing being one of the important stresses that diminish the population of all the abalone species. But it's really never one thing or another that diminishes populations of imperiled species. It's always a number of things hitting one after another. And in the case of abalone, the other thing that's really been happening happening is changes in ocean conditions, which are climate change related, basically. As we've had more and more frequent El Ninos, the water has warmed, and it turns out that kelp actually need cold, clean water to do well. But when we have warm water and storms that come with El Ninos, that also can create problems for kelp and for abalone, because when abalone don't have enough to eat, they have a trouble reproducing, they have trouble growing, and if you're having fishing as well as these environmental stressors, it's been too much for these animals to handle. While your book talks about the biological history and behavior and knowledge that we have of abalone for the layperson, not for the scientist per se, but it provides that scientific information, I was intrigued by the detailed history of the pollution political efforts to preserve and protect this animal and was thinking the book should really be titled The Abalone Wars because I don't think most people, even environmentalists like myself, were aware of how for over 100 years there was a battle over trying to protect the abalone. Yeah, there really was an abalone war. And one of the things that shocked me about this was oftentimes that war was between commercial fishermen and sport fishermen. You know, who was going to get the allocation? Who was going to get abalone? But really, everybody else was excluded from the conversation, meaning the people who might care about making sure we have abalone as kindred spirits into the future or indigenous people. And I think even people who enjoyed eating abalone, who benefited from commercial harvest, just weren't clued in, weren't aware of the challenges that abalone were facing in real time. There just was a a disconnect. And so that was something that was really sad to understand. But the reason I didn't call it a war, Nancy, there is a chapter that is called The Abalone Wars in my book, is I really wanted to focus on this animal and how special and beautiful it is. We've been discovering so much now that scientists are focusing on them. And your book has details about the controversy in terms of how to preserve and protect them and the political fights because people would see the abalone, they thought there were plenty of them, they wanted to capture them, they didn't want to preserve and protect them. The biologists were saying, no, these animals aren't reproducing well, they're getting endangered, they need protection. So you have a lot of information about the political dynamics involved in protecting a species. And you also talk about the difficulties of the biologists who want to try to reintroduce the species and the problems of captive breeding, that they don't easily breed in captivity. So those are two issues that I'd like to know where the current status is. Yeah, I am one who always is liking to look for the hope in this story, too. And abalone are such 
beautiful, inspiring creatures because of how special they are, even though, you know, some people will say, oh, it's just a shellfish, but there's something about abalone that just inspires people, I have to say. And so it's no surprise that people, scientists on the California coast have been trying to figure out how to restore the most imperiled of these animals. And I was really fascinated and delighted to meet some of these people and learn about the difficult path they've had in trying to restore the most endangered abalone, which is white abalone, a deeper water species, or that was thought to be the deepest water species. And basically, there were so few left that even before this species was listed on the endangered species list, some of the scientists said, we need to bring them in and try to do captive breeding. And as you alluded to, it turned out to be much harder than they thought. There is some aquaculture of abalone commercially, we should be able to just raise these animals and plant them out. Well, a couple of problems occur. One is that when you raise animals, of course, in great masses together, they're very vulnerable to disease. And it turned out that another stress that hit abalone in the 1980s was a disease called withering syndrome. And so this withering syndrome caused abalone's feet to shrivel up and uh, the animals couldn't hold on, couldn't protect themselves and died. That disease was a big challenge that scientists had to overcome in figuring out how to restore abalone. But then another big problem is getting the animals in the mood to reproduce when they're in tanks, uh, when they're in an aquaculture setting. Scientists didn't know any of the cues uh, or what was needed to get animals into reproductive fitness and condition to reproduce well. So that was another thing they've had to sort out and figure. In fact, there was just a New York Times story about a new technology they're using now to use ultrasound to try to help to see if these white abalone are ready to reproduce to try to facilitate this restoration effort. The last thing that was a big challenge is that even if you can grow these little animals in an aquaculture setting, once you put them out into the ocean, you're putting them into a sea of predators. And so they've had to figure out how do we get these animals out and ready and growing and getting used to their undersea habitat before they're knocked off. So that's been another thing that has had to be studied. And there's been all sorts of experiments with different types of protective structures that can help abalone get situated. And then lastly, one of the things that is so problematic is the same thing that makes us love abalone really propels sort of a black market in poaching of these animals. It's been very difficult to overcome because they're so cherished and beloved. They're very valuable on the black market. There's a market in Asia still for these animals. Even if we're restoring these animals, even if we do everything we can, because there's a monetary value to them that is still so high, they remain vulnerable. Are the laws sufficient? Does the commissions responsible for our wildlife life, looking after them and making sure that they are protected? In 2017, the recreational fishery in Northern California was closed for the first time. In 1997, the recreational and commercial fishing for abalone was closed. So there's been no fishing for abalone uh, in different parts of California, hoping with the aim that these animals would have time to replenish and restore themselves. But it takes a long time. With regards to poaching, we rely on game wardens or fish and wildlife wardens to keep an eye out on poachers. The coast is very big and there's not enough of those officers to keep an eye. So it's an ongoing challenge. You have written so many wonderful stories within this story from your book, Abalone, The Remarkable History and Uncertain Future of California's Iconic Shellfish. It's reflective of the detail that you do on all of your books. I know that you've spent many, many years researching the abalone. And I recall your wonderful book, Kitchen Literacy, How We Lost Knowledge of Where Food Comes From and Why We Need to Get It Back, as well as your book, Discovering the Unknown Landscape, A History of America's Wetlands. So many marvelous stories about animals, plants, ecosystems. What message do you want people to end up with after reading this book? Because as far as I'm concerned, I fell in love all over again with the abalone and just wish I could see them again massively 
populated along our tide pools so we can enjoy their beauty and know how important they are to be there. The message that I'd like people to understand with this book in particular is that these animals that we use as wild foods and that we continue to use as wild foods, abalone, but so many other, that we have to be very careful in how we use them, especially as we have these increasing stresses with climate change. They're more vulnerable than we thought that they were. And so I kind of think of abalone as sentinel animals for all the wild animals that we still use as foods. Thank you so much for loving and caring about this animal and letting all of us know more about it. Thank you for being my guest. Thank you so much for having me, Nancy. It's always fun to talk to you. I have been speaking with Anne Vilisis, who is an award-winning independent scholar, writer, and author of Abalone, The Remarkable History and Uncertain Future of California's Iconic Shellfish. I'm Nancy Perlman. Thank you very much for joining us, and do tune in again next week. If you would like free information about these environmental issues, go to www.ecoprojects.org or call 310-559-9160. Environmental Directions with your host, Nancy Perlman, is a community affairs program of the nonprofit organization Educational Communications and this station.